Good evening and welcome to E-Bible Fellowship's Bible Study in the Book of Revelation. Tonight is study number 31 of Revelation chapter 6. And we're going to read Revelation 6 verse 14 through the end of the chapter. And the heaven departed as a scroll when it is rolled together, and every mountain and island were moved out of their places. And the kings of the earth and the great men and the rich men and the chief captains and the mighty men and every bondman and every free man hid themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the mountains and said to the mountains and rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath is come, and who shall be able to stand? Now we've been looking at this passage for some time, and we've seen that It is referring to the spiritual judgment of God upon the earth in the day of judgment when he removes the lights of the Gospels, the sun, the moon, and the stars, as they are light bearers. And they typify the Gospel light that shines in this world. And we also saw when the heaven departed as a scroll, when it is rolled together, that the word scroll is the Greek word biblion, from which we get our English word Bible. And it is exactly as it sounds. God opened the Bible, and the the Bible, his word, established the spiritual heavens. Then, Then came time at the end, once he concluded his salvation program, that he closes the Bible and the Bible ceases to give forth its light. And, and that is the picture that God is giving us. But now we want to move on and look at the rest of this language. And verse 14, in the second half of the verse, says, And every mountain and island were moved out of their places. And some people think that this is literally uh, speaking of events that will take place on Judgment Day. That is, they literally think that God is going to move the mountains and the islands on the Day of Judgment. And yet that doesn't make sense, even in the context of these verses, because if God were moving the mountains, then they would be the most dangerous place to be, the most unstable place to be. And yet, He goes on to tell us of the kings of the earth and the great men and and so on. And every free man hid themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the mountains. They were trying to find refuge, trying to find safety in the mountains themselves. And, uh, of course, people wouldn't have time to flee to mountains for them to literally hide them. Then why would you go to mountains if the mountains were being moved out of their places? No, that that doesn't make any sense at all. It's only once we understand this language spiritually that we begin to see what God is saying here. And, of course, the spiritual meaning would continue uh, along the same lines as the previous verses. Well, what does it mean then that every mountain and island were moved out of their places? I don't know if we can know this completely as far as everything that God has in view here, but we can know some things about this. For instance, mountains uh, oftentimes represent kingdoms in the Bible. Some mountains represent the kingdom of God. Mount Sinai, for instance. God also refers to Mount Zion, referring to the body of his people. Other mountains represent the kingdom of Satan. Now, let, let's uh, take a look at the word mountain or mountains in the Bible, and we'll see how God uses it. And then we'll come back to this verse, and, and we'll have a better understanding, at least, of what the Lord is telling us. Let's first go to the Old Testament book of Exodus, Exodus chapter 19, 
and and Moses is uh, in the Mount Sinai, and um, he is receiving the law of God, the Ten Commandments. And it says in verse 18 of Exodus 19, And Mount Sinai was altogether on a smoke, because Jehovah descended upon it in fire, and the smoke thereof ascended as the smoke of a furnace, and the whole mount quaked greatly. And then following this, um, Moses, who received the law at Mount Sinai, will deliver the Ten Commandments to Israel. In Exodus 20, in verse 1, And God spake all these words, saying, I am Jehovah thy God, which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above, or that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, nor serve them. For I, Jehovah thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me. And then uh, the Ten Commandments continue on. And we read in verse 18 of Exodus 20, And all the people saw the thunderings and the lightnings and the noise of the trumpet and the mountains smoking. And when the people saw it, they removed and stood afar off. And the, the word of God, as the Ten Commandments, really represent the complete word of God. The number 10 in the Bible typifies completeness. God gave Ten Commandments to typify and figure the Bible, which is the complete law of God. And the Ten Commandments were given on Mount Sinai, and, and so the, the commandments, the, the law of God, the word of God, the Bible identifies with a mountain. And therefore, the kingdom of God identifies with a mountain. You know, this is why, for instance, God uh, commanded in Matthew chapter 24, during the time of the Great Tribulation, in verse 15, it says, When ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet stand in the holy place, whoso readeth, let him understand then let them which be in Judea flee into the mountains. Now we have learned over the last several years that the abomination of desolation is a type of Satan. And of course, his standing in the holy place means that Satan is in the churches and congregations. Here he's called the abomination of desolation. But in Second Thessalonians chapter 2, He's called the man of sin who takes his seat in the temple. And they're, they're both synonymous pictures that God is using of Satan once he's loosed and he overcomes the churches and congregations and begins to rule within them. And at that point, the Lord um, commissions his people or commands his people to flee Judea, Judea would uh, represent the churches, and to flee into the mountains. Now, of course, no one thinks that God literally means flee to the mountains. We have mountains in Pennsylvania, and you can be sure that God did not mean for his people who live in Pennsylvania to come out of their churches and go to the mountains. No, it had nothing to do with literal mountains, we, we need to be constantly reminded that the Bible is a spiritual book that Christ spoke in parables, and we must look for the deeper spiritual meaning. And the mountains, well, they, they relate to the mountain of God, to the place where God's word is found, to the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God. And when God commanded, come out of the church and flee to the mountains... He meant, flee to my word, which 
is completely identified with my kingdom, with the kingdom of God. In Psalm 125, Psalm 125, in the first couple of verses, it says, They that trust in Jehovah shall be as Mount Zion, which cannot be removed, but abideth forever. As the mountains are round about Jerusalem, so Jehovah is round about his people from henceforth even forever. See, God is, is typified by those mountains. And, and how do we flee to God? How do we find refuge and safety in God? Well, only through the Bible, only through the Word of God. And, and that's exactly what the Lord's people did. They came out of the churches and they found fellowship with God through his word, the Bible, and they gathered thereby on the mountains of Israel. And that's another uh, figure that, that the Lord uses in Ezekiel. In Ezekiel chapter 34, as uh, he is finding fault with the shepherds of Israel, who are not properly feeding the flock, but rather feeding themselves of the flock, finally God uh, determines to end their service. In Ezekiel 34, verses 9 and 10, Therefore, O ye shepherds, hear the word of Jehovah. Thus saith the Lord Jehovah, Behold, I am against the shepherds, and I will require my flock at their hand, and cause them to cease from feeding the flock. Neither shall the shepherds feed themselves any more. For I will deliver my flock from their mouth, that they may not be meat for them. And in effect, God just ended the church age, is basically what those verses are, are stating. That I have removed all authority given to the pastors and the elders and the deacons and um, those with spiritual oversight within the churches and congregations and given the task of feeding the sheep within the church. No, you no longer have that official capacity. You no longer have the authority given by God. And I have ended the church age, and I am commanding my people to come out, just as we read in Matthew 24. And there God said, let those that um, are in Judea, flee to the mountains. Well, what's he say here in verse 11 of Ezekiel 34? For thus saith the Lord Jehovah, Behold, I, even I, will both search my sheep and seek them out, as a shepherd seeketh out his flock in the day that he is among his sheep that are scattered. So I seek out my sheep and will deliver them out of all places where they have been scattered in a cloudy and dark day. And I will bring them out from the people and gather them from the countries and will bring them to their own land and feed them upon the mountains of Israel by the rivers and in all the inhabited places of the country. I will feed them in a good pasture and upon the high mountains of Israel shall their fold be. There shall they lie in a good fold and in a fat pasture shall they feed Upon the mountains of Israel, I will feed my flock, and I will cause them to lie down, saith the Lord Jehovah. Now, God is indicating that his people will come out of the churches. They will go, therefore, to the mountains, which is the Bible, the word of God. And it is upon the mountains that he will feed his sheep. And that's exactly the... Um, time period we're in, as God has already found the lost sheep. That's what evangelization is. That's what sending forth the gospel accomplishes. That's not feeding sheep. That is finding sheep, finding the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And salvation finds the sheep. And then once found, well, the sheep are brought to the mountain. They're brought to where the word of God is proclaimed to the Bible. And it is upon the mountains as these 
uh, sheep, these saved individuals, begin to read the Bible, that God will feed them. And God tells us that he uses people, he, he uses others to, to teach because he cannot break the barrier of the supernatural since the Bible was completed. And so he will open up scripture as he has done from the beginning of the Great Tribulation, and he will cause individuals to use the proper methodology of comparing Scripture with Scripture and carefully making sure their conclusions harmonize with the whole Bible. And then as a result, the Holy Ghost teacheth, and that is how God feeds his sheep. He, he does it through that methodology. And yet he is indicating that the sheep are fed upon the mountains of Israel, the mountain representing the kingdom of God. And, you know, there is God's kingdom, and then there is Satan's kingdom. And we, we see this with a, a pretty stark contrast in a historical picture. In the book of 1 Samuel, in 1 Samuel, as Goliath was coming out to challenge uh, an Israelite to do battle with him, and he did this for 40 days, and, and Goliath is a type and figure of, of Satan or, or Satan's kingdom, or at least a representative probably of Satan himself, and David who comes forth to do battle with Goliath, is a type and figure of the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, notice in 1 Samuel 17, in verse 2, And Saul and the men of Israel were gathered together and pitched by the valley of Elah, and set the battle in array against the Philistines. And the Philistines stood on a mountain on the one side, and Israel stood on a mountain on the other side, and there was a valley between them. And, and that is a, a good illustration of the kingdom of God, the kingdom of God's dear son, and the kingdom of darkness, the kingdom of Satan, each on a mountain, and, and the battle takes place in the valley below. And so we can see that Satan also has a kingdom as he won the victory over mankind in the Garden of Eden and uh, man became subject to him and, and and he therefore became a ruler. He's the prince of the power of the air. He's typified by the king of Babylon and he is the ruler of the unsaved people of the world. And it is um, often through his workings that false gods and false religions are developed. And, and we find, for instance, in um, the book of Jeremiah, in Jeremiah 3, in verse 6, Jehovah said also unto me in the days of Josiah the king, Hast thou seen that which backsliding Israel hath done? She has gone up upon every high mountain and under every green tree, and there has played the harlot. Idolatry often took place upon the mountains and the high hills of Israel, is where they would set up their high places, and, and these were places of idolatrous worship, and, and therefore places where Satan uh, would receive worship. And speaking of that, when Satan was set up as the man of sin within the churches and the congregations, he uh, is said in Isaiah chapter 14 to have been exalted to a very lofty place. And let me read from Isaiah 14, beginning in verse 12. And there it says, How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground, which didst weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation 
In the sides of the north, I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. And and Satan、uh, had opportunity to proclaim this when he took his seat as the man of sin. He he took his seat in the temple, and and that is where God's people were traditionally found. Historically, they were there for almost two thousand years. And now he had ascended, and and taken the throne. He was ruling as the man of sin, and he is the one typified as the king of Babylon, who takes Judah, who destroys Jerusalem, who is the victor. He is the winner during the period of the great tribulation over the churches and congregations. And so he is sitting upon the mount of the congregation, the mount of God, the corporate outward representation of the kingdom of God on earth is the mount of the congregation, and there Satan was seated as king, reigning over the churches and congregations of the world, and so we see how the mountain. Can typify Satan and his rule. Let's just go also to Revelation chapter seventeen, and and we'll read of the beast. And the beast is the name God gave to Satan as he ruled during the time of the great tribulation. And it says in verse eight, the beast that thou sawest was and is not, and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit. And go into perdition, and they that dwell on the earth shall wonder, whose names were not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world, when they behold the beast that was and is not and yet is. And here is the mind which has wisdom: the seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sitteth, and there are seven kings. Five are fallen, and one is. And the other is not yet come, and when he cometh, he must continue a short space. And the beast that was and is not, even he is the eighth and is of the seven, and goeth into perdition. And then it continues. But here we find that the beast、um, had seven heads and ten horns. And and if you remember in Revelation thirteen. In verse one, I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his heads the name of blasphemy. And here God says that the seven heads are seven mountains, and there are seven kings, because it is picturing. Seven periods of rule of Satan as king over the earth, and then finally at the end over the complete church, the corporate church, as that has been given to him to to rule, and and God did that in order to bring judgment on the churches and congregations. But seven mountains typify the rule of Satan throughout the history of this world, and notice. In verse ten of Revelation seventeen, five are fallen, and one is, and so the five that fell would identify with the period of time from the fall of sin back in the Garden of Eden all the way up until the cross, and then as、uh, the Apostle John is being moved to write in the first century A.D., he says one is, so Satan. Has a particular rule in the world over the unsaved, even after being bound at the cross, he he still went about as a roaring lion seeking whom to devour, and and so that rule would continue as he would be、um, afflicting the congregations. He would be active within them, sowing tares amongst the wheat throughout the New Testament church age. Yet he would not rule. Until the end, the little season, and that's why it says in the other, and that would be the seventh 
head or the seventh king and therefore the seventh kingdom. The other is not yet come, and when he cometh, he must continue a short space. And that short space is the little season of time, 23 years of the great tribulation. It was given unto him to continue 40 and two months, we read in Revelation 13. And and that is a figure also representing the complete period of great tribulation, the last kingdom, the last rule of Satan. And, and then he will be put down and his kingdom will be put down. He will be conquered. And, uh, you know, it's interesting when we read the flood account back in the book of Genesis, in Genesis chapter 7, as, as God brought the flood on the 17th day of the second month and caused it to rain for 40 days and 40 nights, and we see the similarities to our present time as May 21, 2011, had the underlying Hebrew calendar date of 217. And also, uh, beginning on May 21, 2011, the 1600-day period would be 40 days times 40 days, and then you get 1600 days. And, and so God has the 40 days of rain, and, and he doubles it in a sense by saying 40 days and 40 nights, and not that he's multiplying it, but just indicating that 40 is most definitely in view. Judgment Day will be a severe time of testing. But also we read in Genesis 7, in verse 17, And the flood was 40 days upon the earth, and the waters increased, and bare up the ark, and it was lift up above the earth. And the waters prevailed and were increased greatly upon the earth. And the ark went upon the face of the waters, and the waters prevailed exceedingly upon the earth, and all the high hills that were under the whole heaven were covered. Fifteen cubits upward did the waters prevail, and the mountains were covered. The high hills and the mountains are covered by the water, the water that God sent forth to judge, to destroy the world. And as we relate the flood, as it is a type and figure of Judgment Day, to our time, we understand the waters to represent the Word of God that is bringing the judgment upon all the unsaved inhabitants of the earth. And the waters prevailed, the waters are victorious over the high hills where all the idols are found, all the religions of men, all the false gospels of Christianity, all that encompasses the kingdom of Satan, and especially his rule in the churches over the mount of the congregation throughout the great tribulation period, came to an abrupt end as God deposed him and put him down and judged Satan further. And now we're living in a time when the mountains are moved out of their place.